This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Watch another brand new full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that covers the second phase of Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, along with 18 other full-length episodes with over six hours worth of combined content, covering over a dozen other major 21st century conflicts, all of which you can access by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle deal for less than $15 a year at curiositystream.com slash lore. Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine more than eight months ago is leading not only to the destruction of Ukraine, but to the destruction of Russia itself. Tens of thousands of people on both sides have already lost their lives over this conflict. And that's in addition to the more than 7.5 million Ukrainians who have left their country as refugees, and the more than a million Russians who have left theirs as exiles. On September 21st, Putin announced the first wartime mobilization of men in Russia since the Second World War, a call for at least 300,000 additional men to be drafted and sent to the front line in Ukraine to fight, and potentially, to die. Within hours of that announcement, the prices for flights going anywhere outside of Russia skyrocketed to never-before-seen rates, as hundreds of thousands of Russian men suddenly became desperate to leave their country and escape. But they had and continue to have very limited options for escape. For months beforehand, nearly every country in Europe and North America had blocked off their airspaces to all Russian flights, and nearly every European-based carrier had shut down their flights to Russia as well. By the time of Putin's mobilization announcement, there were only two European-based carriers remaining, operating flights to Russia. Air Serbia out of Belgrade, and Turkish Airlines out of Istanbul. For any Russians fleeing the country by commercial air to Europe, these were the only two choices to pick from, and so their prices temporarily exploded to more than 9,000 euros for a one-way economy fare ticket out of Moscow, which is more than half the median annual salary for everyday Russians. Most everyday Russians simply couldn't afford that high of a price to fly to Europe to escape but it started becoming increasingly difficult to escape by land as well. By the end of September, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and even Finland had each taken the unprecedented step to completely lock their land borders down with Russia, denying anyone with Russian citizenship entry for any reason even if they held valid visas. That meant that travel by land to Europe was also mostly impossible for Russians fleeing the country. Unless, of course, they wanted to book it through the active war zone in Ukraine. The only possible land route to Europe for escaping Russians still remaining as of the production of this video is through the very narrow sliver of Norway in the far northwest of the country. Norway has still not shut down their small border here with Russia yet, and the E-105 highway that leads to it beyond Murmansk continues to remain open for now. But for most Russians fleeing the consequences of this war, the route of Norway is thousands of kilometers away from them and difficult and expensive to get to. At the same time, an estimated 70% of Russian citizens don't even possess a passport that's required for international travel like this. And that means that for most Russians wanting to flee the country, their only really good options are to the south in the former Soviet countries of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, and Armenia, where they can all still enter without visas, and some even without passports. As members of the Eurasian Economic Union, basically Russia's version of the European Union, Russians entering into Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia retain the right to live and work within them making them the easiest and the cheapest countries for Russians to escape into. As a result, satellite imagery taken on September the 25th shows a huge traffic jam of desperate Russian vehicles attempting to cross the border into Georgia, potentially as long as 30 kilometers or 19 miles. In a similar fashion, queues of Russians in cars attempting to enter Kazakhstan can be seen in video clips stretching for nearly as far as the eye can see. Hundreds of thousands of Russians have already made it down to these four countries, and more coming down all the time. But they're not the only places that Russians are escaping to. In one particularly desperate and bold case, two Russian men evading the draft acquired a boat in the remote far eastern town of Egvekinot, and sailed it nearly 500 kilometers across the Bering Sea to the American town of Gamble on Alaska's St. Lawrence Island, where they immediately requested asylum and were flown over to Anchorage by U.S. officials for processing. Many more who couldn't escape or leave for whatever reason began searching on Google how to break their own arms or limbs just in order to avoid the draft. The day after Putin's mobilization announcement, the term how to break an arm at home became the top search trend on Google within Russia. In total, within merely a month of Putin's announcement of partial military mobilization in Russia, more than 700,000 people, most of them young military-age men, have fled the country to somewhere else abroad more than double the amount of men that Putin announced he was planning on having drafted. This is also in addition to the more than 500,000 Russians who had already left the country before the mobilization was even announced. People
people of all different kinds, from YouTubers, journalists, and political refugees, fearful of 15-year jail sentences for opposing the war online, to millionaires fearful of losing their assets in the West, to tech workers fearful of losing their Western jobs, alongside many others. That means that at least 1.2 million Russians have left the country since the invasion of Ukraine began, representing the largest exodus of Russians from the country in history since the 1917 October Revolution and the Bolshevik rise to power. And that isn't even to say anything of the unknown numbers of Russian men getting killed and maimed for life in Ukraine, which, according to US estimates, is already at least 70 to 80,000 killed and wounded, with Ukrainian losses in life probably being very similar, already making it the deadliest war seen in Europe in generations since 1945. And all of this loss of people either to warfare or to migration is only exacerbating what was already arguably Russia's and Ukraine's biggest problem before the war. Their populations were each already in a terminal decline for decades. And this war is only making that problem a lot worse. It could get so bad that within 20 years from now, we may not even recognize either Russia or Ukraine as countries in the same way we see them today, and they may no longer even exist as we know them. Let me explain a little bit what I mean. This on the left is the population pyramid of Russia, while this on the right is the population pyramid of Ukraine. These graphs are essentially a snapshot of both countries' populations that reveal the numbers of people of all ages and genders, and they both appear very similar, which is a bad thing. At the top of each, you can see these gaps in people in their 70s, the World War II generation that suffered tens of millions of people dead in both countries. To be born a boy anywhere in the Soviet Union in 1923 was perhaps the single worst time, place, and gender to have been born across most of human history. 3.4 million boys were born in the Soviet Union that year. And by the time these 3.4 million boys would be 23 years old at the end of 1946, more than two-thirds of them would already be dead. To have been born male in the Soviet Union in 1923, you had less than a one in three chance of surviving beyond your 23rd birthday. The loss in life of so many young people like this throughout the 1930s and 40s meant that a lot of young people at that time in both Ukraine and Russia were never able to have any children. And that meant the kids they never had simply didn't exist around 20 years later when they would normally also be having their own kids, causing a population hit or echo of the lost World War II generation around here in the mid to late 1960s that reduced their population equivalent of Gen Xers. These echoes of the lost World War II generation continue to ripple across both Russian and Ukrainian society about every 20 to 25 years. But the two most recent ripples hitting the Zoomers, and whatever generation is being born now will be called, have come almost precisely at times of other great national crises, which only exacerbated their problems for both countries' populations. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed just as the second echo of the lost World War II generation was starting. With the collapse in Soviet-era state services and structures came a rocketing in the rates of alcoholism, opioid use, suicides, crime, and HIV-AIDS that plagued the populations of both Ukraine and Russia alike for years afterwards, and caused each of their life expectancies, especially for men, to plummet. Throughout the mid-1990s and early 2000s, the life expectancy for Russian and Ukrainian men alike were 17 years fewer than men over in Western Europe, and 13 years fewer than their female counterparts. They were nearly on a par with men in Afghanistan and many sub-Saharan African nations despite being at peace. And at the same time, rates of migration abroad following the collapse of the Iron Curtain and communism exploded, as millions of Ukrainians and Russians sought out better opportunities for themselves and their families abroad over in the West. And simultaneously, as the death and migration rates were skyrocketing in the 90s, the numbers of births to replace them were plummeting, a situation which continues to this day. Ukrainian women, even before the invasion, were only having an average of 1.16 children each, the second lowest rate of births anywhere in the world just behind South Korea, and well, well beneath the natural population replacement level of 2.1 births per woman. And, unlike many Western countries that make up for their own low levels of births with high levels of immigration, Ukraine has had a net negative rate of migration for decades, with many times more people leaving every year than entering. So naturally, as a result of all these factors, the population of Ukraine has literally decreased every single year since 1993, down from a peak of nearly 52 million people right at the end of the Cold War to just over 41 million immediately before the invasion. 
when also factoring in the 2.5 million people in Crimea who were lost to the Russians in 2014. Overall, this represents a crash of nearly 20% of the Ukrainian population in only 30 years. And Russia's situation isn't that much better. Plagued with largely the same societal and medical issues as Ukraine following the Soviet collapse, in the 30 years now since 1992, Russia has only ever seen three years of population growth between 2013 and 2015, while every single other year has been nothing but continuous decline. With a current birth rate of 1.5 children per woman overall, and a slightly positive immigration rate of people mostly coming from Central Asia, the Russians have been losing people at a slower rate than Ukraine, but they've still been losing people. And the official numbers of births across Russia are also fairly deceiving, because Russia is a multi-ethnic country, and the ethnic Russians themselves are having far fewer children than their ethnic minorities are. This is a map of all the oblasts, republics, and provinces of Russia colored and numbered by birth rate seen a decade ago in 2012. And this is a map of all of Russia's various ethnic groups. And, as you can see, the regions of higher birth rates almost identically overlap with the regions of Russia's various ethnic minorities. Like in Buryatia, Saka, Tuva, Dagestan, Chechnya, the North Caucasus, and Tatarstan. Many of these ethnically distinct regions of Russia already enjoy a large degree of autonomy from the central government in Moscow, and almost operate like quasi-independent countries. And some of them, like Chechnya and Dagestan, have previously fought bloody wars of independence from Russia in very recent history that failed, but may not fail again as the population of Russians continues to decline, while the populations of these groups continues to increase, they may demand more autonomy from Moscow or even independence once again. And if one of them ever becomes successful in the future, like Chechnya, it could trigger a cascading effect of more and more of the other internal republics declaring their independence as well, and lead to a disillusion or even collapse across the Russian Federation. And while that might seem unlikely right now, remember that Russia has been a multi-ethnic empire for centuries, and has already collapsed twice in the previous century, in 1917 and again in 1991. There is no guarantee with its population crisis and badly going war in Ukraine that it won't or can't happen sometime again this century. But even with the seizure of Crimea from Ukraine in 2014 that theoretically added 2.5 million people into Russia, Russia's overall population today is still lower than it was before the collapse of the Soviet Union by nearly a million people which wasn't helped out at all by the years of the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020 and 2021 alone, due to excess COVID-19 deaths and a still very low birth and migration rate, the Russian population lost 1.7 million people. The largest loss of people ever in Russia during peacetime, and the largest loss in general since the Second World War. And now, in 2022, with the unleashing of the biggest war seen in Russia and Ukraine since the Second World War, this population problem for both of them that has been going on for the past 30 years now is only going to get way, way worse than it even already was. For Ukraine, at least 7.6 million people have evacuated the country and become refugees since the invasion began, meaning that nearly 1 in 5 Ukrainians before the invasion have left the country in less than 8 months. That is a similar loss in population that Ukraine experienced over 30 years between the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Russian invasion itself, and implies that there's only around 33.5 million Ukrainians remaining within the country right now, nearly 20 million less than there were immediately after the Soviet collapse. And of course, that is to say nothing of the unknown numbers of Ukrainian soldiers and civilians alike who have lost their lives or become catastrophically injured since the invasion began, which is almost certainly a very high number stretching into the tens to hundreds of thousands. Ukraine will never be the same again after this war is over, even if they do push all the way ahead to ultimate victory. And while the raw numbers of Russia's exiles leaving the country are nowhere near as large or catastrophic as Ukraine's refugees, they're still pretty bad for Russia's internal demographics. Remember that the vast majority of the 1.2 million Russians who have already left so far are either highly educated or young, and especially are young men. Before the invasion, Russia had about 33 million young men between the ages of 16 and 49, who could theoretically be capable of military service. 
conservatively estimating that around 800,000 of those men have since left the country, and at least 70,000 others have become killed or wounded in Ukraine so far. That is nearly 3% of Russia's total supply of men younger than 49 who will no longer contribute to the economy or the military so far. As the war in Ukraine continues to drag on and casualties continue to mount up, Putin will be forced into calling in more draftees and conscripts to replace the losses. And that means that more and more draft-age men are going to be leaving the country to escape it. In order to stop them from leaving, Russia will eventually be left with little other choice than to shut down their borders completely like during the Soviet era, and dramatically increase repression and surveillance at home which will lead to people becoming even more desperate to leave and escape as Russia descends more and more into the authoritarianism and even totalitarianism of the past. Russia has already lost more people this year than it has in any other year since World War II, breaking its own record for that that was only set last year in 2021. How many more will it and Ukraine lose by the time the war is over? And will either of them, with historically low birth and migration rates, ever be able to actually recover? I don't know the answer to either of those questions, but it does appear that Putin is using the invasion of Ukraine to try and expand Russia's population and solve some of his own country's problem. Within days of ordering the mobilization on September the 30th, Russia unilaterally announced their annexations of four Ukrainian oblasts, Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson, collectively representing about 15% of Ukraine's total territory and the largest annexation or conquest of land seen in Europe since the Second World War. Only one other country in the world has so far recognized these Russian annexations as legitimate, North Korea, which I guess is unsurprising. And despite declaring them as Russian territory, the Russians themselves only occupy parts of each, with the Ukrainian military still in control of large sections of each, including the capital of the Zaporizhia Oblast. But by declaring these territories as integral parts of Russia, Putin has given himself the legal ability to deploy freshly drafted conscripts to them to fight. Under Russian law, conscripts cannot legally be sent to fight in wars abroad and may only be used to defend the territorial integrity of Russia itself. So, now that Russia has declared these oblasts as parts of Russia, the hundreds of thousands of men being drafted can now legally be sent there to fight against the Ukrainians. And, moreover, annexing them is stealing about 9 million civilians away from Ukraine and forcibly adding them into Russia. Which, in Putin's mind, may be sufficient numbers to replace the people that his country is losing to casualties and exiles. But that's of course assuming that Ukraine, being increasingly well supplied with arms from the West, won't simply just recapture them and take all those people back. Which continues to remain a possible, if not even plausible, scenario. Of course, there's other reasons and explanations behind Putin's decision to invade Ukraine and escalate the conflict further, from Ukraine's recently discovered oil and gas reserves to Russia's own desire to expand their territory towards more geographically defensible frontiers. But regardless of Putin's justifications, the war in Ukraine is among the darkest chapters of 21st century history so far, and it is partially a consequence of Russia's own internal demographic crisis that has been going on for decades now. But unfortunately, if I produced videos covering the war itself, self on YouTube, with the full details of what's actually happening on the ground and why it's all happening, the disturbing, violent, and controversial details of discussing a catastrophic ongoing war would cause the videos to become demonetized and age-restricted, which is something I completely understand and frankly agree with. I don't believe ads should be shown alongside suffering and tragedy, but it does ultimately mean that YouTube's algorithm wouldn't promote these videos to you because of their age restriction, and that means that you simply wouldn't ever see them here. And that's why instead, I created yet another full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that I uploaded directly to Nebula titled Russia's Invasion of Ukraine Phase 2. This episode covers what appears to be the second phase of the Russian invasion taking place immediately after my first episode on this conflict that I released last month that covers the invasion's first phase and why the Russian army failed in its initial blitzkrieg and goal of capturing the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. This second episode I've produced for the ongoing Ukraine war covers how the Russian and Ukrainian armies entered into a long, grinding stalemate for months, and then how the Ukrainians managed to defy all the odds and push back against the Russians, reclaiming thousands of square kilometers worth of their occupied territory in days, and see the momentum that led Putin to announce his country's military mobilization just last month. 
As you've probably heard by now, Nebula is home to tons of exclusive ad-free content, like my entire Modern Conflict series, with 18 other full-length episodes containing more than six hours worth of combined additional content that you can go and watch right now covering recent major wars and conflicts that'll help you stay up to date on what's going on in our world and why. From this video covering Russia's previous invasion of Georgia back in 2008, to this one covering the ongoing Chinese genocide against the Uyghur people in Xinjiang, to this one covering Russia's military intervention in the Syrian civil war, and many others. I'm releasing new Modern Conflicts episodes exclusively to Nebula every month, and of course, the reason why all of these videos are only available on Nebula in the first place is because they just wouldn't ever work here on YouTube, and would never be able to be viewed here because of the way this site works in relation to highly controversial and sensitive recent events. But on the other hand, Nebula is a totally different platform without an algorithm and without any ads. It's just a platform about great and unique content made by great and independent educational creators, with plenty of other unique, exclusive bonus projects from other creators you probably already know, like Real Engineering's incredible World War II-era Battle of Britain and Logistics of D-Day series, multiple hour-long-plus documentaries from Wendover Productions, and so much more. The best way to get access to Nebula and all of this incredible exclusive content Content is definitely through the truly amazing Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle deal. And with its current sales price, it's less than $15 a year to get full access to both of them. And Curiosity Stream has some pretty awesome stuff that you're definitely going to enjoy watching as well. Like this documentary called Putin and the Oligarchs, a 43 minute documentary explaining in incredible depth where Vladimir Putin's regime in Russia came from and how it actually continues to operate and wage war in Ukraine, which will give you a huge amount of context behind what's happening right now. I really can't recommend it enough, and I genuinely don't know about a better deal that exists anywhere in streaming. You get two streaming sites, both with content you'll actually watch, and all for less than $15 a year at the current sales price. But what's even more, signing up will actually help countless independent educational creators beyond just real-life lore. So please make sure to do so by clicking the button that's here on your screen right now, which will take you directly to curiositystream.com slash real-life lore to sign up, or by following the link that's down below in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching.